Good evening, everyone. Welcome to UMR Connects. Wow, good crowd. Um, beating the heat anyway, right? Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with UMR Connects and maybe just saw one of our posters or flyers, we meet every week. Uh, for the summer, we're normally out on the Peace Plaza, and that's where we'll be next week when we welcome um, Tom Nosted, who's a transplant recipient, and he'll be sharing his uh, path to gratitude. So please come back for that. It's a beautiful story, and uh, we'll be outside, and right down on the Peace Plaza next to the Kaler, um, on the Kaler stage. If you haven't already signed up for our door prize drawing, please do. Uh, just your name. If you want to receive an email about upcoming events, you can include that. Otherwise, it's a, a door prize drawing for a $20 gift card to the M Gear store downstairs. Um, and now, without further ado, uh, Katie Berg is here to uh, talk tonight. Uh, Katie was raised on a farm in southwest Minnesota. She, la she later found her way to Rochester and lived here for 13 years with her husband and eventually two children. <laughs> uh, ended up with a big house, two cars, and all of a sudden started questioning why. Uh, after, a, after three years of paring down, took a trip to Nicaragua and found a simpler, simpler life. When they came back, they were looking for schools for their, for their children as the number one priority and ended up being accepted into a Chinese immersion school in St. Paul. Um, wanting to continue our simpler lifestyle, uh, they, ch they chose to live in a very small two-bedroom apartment in downtown St. Paul with Skyway access so they can walk to everything. And we're kind of having fun with quality of life now, huh? <laughs> Please welcome Katie Bird. Thank you so much. It's really fun to be back in Rochester. And the truth is, I never would have left had I not been living vicariously through my children. I tried and failed to learn another language. And like all failures that become parents, for some reason that failure is what we want our kids to succeed at so much. And since I didn't have another language, nor did my husband, nor were there immersion schools in Rochester, we really started to have to think differently about how we were going to give that. I had to leave Rochester. We went to Nicaragua, and now we're in St. Paul. But leaving Rochester has given me interesting things to write about. And writing is what got me invited back here I blog at skywaymom.com, and you have just heard the first 10 sentences of my public speaking career, so <laughs> cross my fingers that this will go well. Uh, what I hope to share with you today is, is some deeper thoughts about stuff. We took three years to downsize, well, four years, it's... We're, we still have piles that go to the Salvation Army, but I'd say we are down 80-90% of what we used to have. And the big point that I hope to share is that through minimalism or having less stuff, I found it to be a really effective tool for being more productive. And as I chose less things to be important, I was able to realize greater things in those, those things that I had chose to be important. Learning languages, traveling, having more time with family, being less stressed, those sorts of things are what I had chosen to make more important. Anyone know what this is? <laughs> yeah, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This was introduced to the world in 1943, and anyone want to share what it means? It's sure. okay. So, toward the bottom of the pyramid, there are the most basic needs, and in order to move up in the pyramid, you'll have to fulfill the most basic needs first. So, for example, your physiological needs, you have to fulfill them, uh, like you have to like drink water, eat before you can like get to safety needs. 
and then you have to fulfill the safety needs before you can feel like a bubble of belonging. Higher. Perfect. <laughs> That's awesome. Yep, physiological safety, that can be financial security as well as job security in addition to freedom from violence or um, harm. Um, and self-actualization, right? The goal, when he did this, he was thinking about people like Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, people who had really lived their fullest and lived with a greater purpose. Where do you think stuff fits into all of this? The theory is that this is stuff that motivates us, right? To get up in the morning and do things. Where does stuff fit in? Safety? Anywhere else? Love, belonging. Stuff is motivating, don't you think? I don't know about in 1943, but today I would say a lot of people are motivated to work, to get stuff. Ab Abram Maslow was his name. He was what did he do? A, a psychologist. This is psychology 101. Well, if I'm being honest with all of you, this is where my stuff was, right? Today, clothes aren't just clothes. It's a fashion statement, right? Food isn't just food. It's an experience. It's an adventure. Our home isn't just a shelter. It's it expresses who we are, it, it, uh, it gives us self-worth, uh, how we decorate it, you know, comfort. It's, it's a continuously upgradable experience, right? We can always get something else to make ourselves more comfortable. And this is where I was when, when I started um, downsizing. This is what I wanted. <laughs> uh, I wanted lots of self-actualization for me and my kids, lots of esteem, lots of love and belonging. Uh, and in order for me, I discovered that having it on a foundation of less stuff was, was a powerful way to, to make our dreams come true. Modern productivity gurus, what do they say about minimalism and stuff? Is there, do we have any Tony Robbins fans or Stephen Covey? Who else is out there? Zig Ziglar, those do those ring any bells? I'm, I'm a big fan of self-improvement experts. Um, I've heard Zig Ziglar talk and Tony Robbins. And the truth is, I don't know what, where they stand on stuff, right? A certain amount of stuff helps us be more productive. Uh, washing machines, for example, have certainly helped housewives all across the world, career-oriented people, right? Washing clothes is a, is a much simpler task these days. But at what point does stuff, is there diminishing returns? And at what point is it counterproductive? As far as I know, there's a real silence on the subject. There, when we talk about what's important, we talk about family, friends, faith, career, taking care of ourselves, stuff is often left out as an important category in our lives, which is interesting because we have so much stuff and we work so hard to get the stuff and we spend so much time getting the stuff and sorting the stuff. So let's take a tour of stuff. Oh, that's me. Here we go. Here's a family with their stuff. And this actually isn't all their stuff. This is just the stuff that was in their house made of plastic. This is a family that lives in Austria. And the mom, in particular, woke up one morning and decided plastic was bad. And she was not going to... Austria. Austria, yeah, and, and in one fell swoop, they took everything that was made out of plastic, put it in front of their house, and posed for a self-portrait, <laughs> and, and now she uses things that are, aren't, but plastic, along with a lot of other things, have made stuff really abundant, really cheap. Stuff is no longer something that only rich people get to enjoy, right? Every income level is, 
is at risk for too much stuff, right? Um, anyone watch Hoarders? Yeah. Um, it, it, you don't have to be rich to have too much stuff. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here. I, this may or may not go well. I have another. Um, this is copyrighted material, so I have to go directly to his website. It's a photographer that visited 30 different countries around and found families who were perfectly average for their community, for their country, and took pictures of them with all their stuff outside their home instead of inside their home. And I think it's interesting to compare the amount of stuff that people have to live their lives because no matter where you go, people essentially have to do the same things. We have to feed ourselves, we entertain, we raise our kids, we work, we do essentially the same things. But here's a quick tour of, of uh, the stuff that um, people need. This is a family in Bhutan. This is also a family in Bhutan. Let me know if you think I'm going too fast. This is in Cuba. It's a bit of a time warp, 1950s, right? That's when stuff started, stopped coming in. This is in Iceland. Japan. They usually have small homes, but they find ways to put a lot in. This is Kuwait City. Check out that couch. Do you see the couch there? I, don't, I have no idea how that fits into their house, right? <laughs> they have a lot of money in Kuwait. They're subsidized by oil, so they got their four cars, and they're spread out quite a bit. <laughs> this is in Mali. Quite a difference, huh? Another family in Mali. This is Mexico. Mongolia in a yurt. South Africa. Same picture. Thailand. Here's the US. I think that's really interesting to see. Um, oh, where am I? So the nature of stuff. Why? Why do we have stuff? I'm gonna. The hardest lessons that I had growing up, coming of age, were when I had to choose between two things that I cared about, right? Finding out that I couldn't be in two places at once. Do I study? Do I go out with friends? Do I go to my grandma's funeral? Do I impress my new boss? You know, time forces a choice. Stuff doesn't do that, right? Stuff never asks us to choose between two important things. We can literally have it all with stuff, as long as we have a space for it. In the minimalist world, I often hear the phrases, stuff isn't important, experiences are, or stuff doesn't make you happy. You know, why have so much of it? But I think these these phrases miss the point. Stuff is important, and let me know if I'm stretching this here, but in a way, stuff is a way that we can express our immortality, and I think that's why we think it's so important. And it's not because we think we can take it with us, or we can give it away and people can remember us, but with stuff, we can be limitless in what we value. Everything can be important. Our family and stuff friends and stuff, happiness and stuff, experiences and stuff. We really can have stuff alongside all of those things. Pursuing 
more time to do what's important at some point becomes futile, right? But pursuing more space and more stuff to do what's important, now that's attainable, right? That's achievable. That's something we can do. And if we can't find more space, we can always maximize the space we have, right? There's always organizers and shelving units to help us. The they're, um, professional organizers, they started counting how many things are in the American home. Any guesses as to how many items? This is everything, right? Counting your pots, pans, sheets, towels, paper clips, tools, etc. One book, two books, counting every single thing. Any guesses? 600? 10,000? More guesses? 176,000, any others? <laughs> you still aren't there yet. Okay, that was too high. <laughs> 300,000 is the number that they say is the average items that we have in the average American home. It was a newspaper article in the LA Times. There's a link to it at skywaymom.com. Um, I wrote an article about what I'm sharing with you today, so it's there. But yeah, I don't know if it's a box of paper clips that's a thousand paper clips, if that's one thing or if that's a thousand things. I'm not sure. Well, it, could be. <laughs> it could be, right? <laughs> right. Do we need a thousand paper clips, right? <laughs> um, but we probably have. That's how many I have, I'm sure. Um, so, how much of that is important? Do you Right, are 300,000 things. I would say anything that's in our house is important, right? There's a reason that it's there. It has a purpose, a story, and we should value all the things that are in our house. The thing that, that I found was valuing 300,000 things was really overwhelming. And I am going to share... Oh... Oh, yeah. More space and more stuff means more can be important. Oh, I've got facts here. The average size of the American home has nearly tripled in size over the past 50 years. In the 1950s, new construction home builds were average 900 square feet. That's actually how big my apartment is in St. Paul, and I blog about living in a small space. But 50, 60 years ago, that was perfectly average and probably big compared to 100 years ago. One out of, oh, 2,400 is the average size now. And the household size has shrunk. In the 1900s, we, it was a little over four people per household. Now it's 2.5, but our houses have tripled. One out of every 10 Americans rent off-site storage, the fastest growing segment of the commercial real estate industry over the past four decades. The United States has upward of 50,000 storage facilities, five times the number of Starbucks. And if you imagine two and a half feet by three feet square on the floor and eight feet high, the, every man, woman, and child in America has that much stuff that doesn't fit in their house or their garage. It needs to go into a storage facility. 25% of people with two-car garages don't have room to park any car inside them. <laughs> and 32% have room for one vehicle. The home organizational uh, industry is an $8 billion industry and has doubled in size since 2000. And it's growing 10% every year. These facts were gathered by uh, becomingminimalist.com, which is a very... Uh, it's it's uh, very popular website for minimalism on the internet. Oh, I have, a, I have a two and a half minute clip. This is George Carlin, he's a comedian. Uh, this is maybe 20 years old. And it's talking about stuff and how it's important. And there are two swear words in it. One is taking the Lord's name in vain and, and the, there's another one as well. But are you okay with that? Do you wanna see it? Okay. <laughs> 
I would have been out here a little bit sooner, but they gave me uh, the wrong dressing room, and I couldn't find any place to put my stuff. And I don't know how you are, but I need a place to put mm -hmm. my stuff. So that's what I've been doing back there, just trying to find a place for my stuff. You know how important that is. That's the whole, that's the whole meaning of life, isn't it? Trying to find a place for your stuff. That's all your house is. Your house is just a place for your stuff. If you didn't have so much goddamn stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. That's all your house is. It's a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You see that when you take off in an airplane and you look down and you see everybody's got a little pile of stuff. Everybody's got their own pile of stuff. And when you leave your stuff, you got to lock it up. Wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some of your stuff. They always take the good stuff. They don't bother with that crap you're saving. Ain't nobody interested in your fourth grade arithmetic papers. They're looking for the good stuff. That's all your house is. It's a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. Now, sometimes, sometimes you've got to move. You've got to get a bigger house. Why? Too much stuff. You've got to move all your stuff. And maybe put some of your stuff in storage. Imagine that. There's a whole industry based on keeping an eye on your stuff. <laughs> Enough about your stuff. Let's talk about other people's stuff. Did you ever notice when you go to somebody else's house, you never quite feel 100% at home? You know why? No room for your stuff. <laughs> somebody else's stuff is all over the place. And what awful stuff it is. Where did they get this stuff? And if you have to stay overnight at someone's house, you know, unexpectedly, and they give you a little room to sleep in that they don't use that often. Someone died in it 11 years ago. And they haven't moved any of his stuff. Or wherever they give you to sleep, usually right near the bed, there's a dresser, and there's never any room on the dresser for your stuff. Someone else's shit is on the dresser. Have you noticed that their stuff is shit, and your shit is stuff? I love that line. <laughs> he goes on, and it's, I have it on, at skywaymom.com if you want to watch the rest of it. It gets a little more raw or crude at the end. <laughs> so my stuff and my original attempt to have it all and do it all. This is my house in Rochester, and we built it in 2006. We lived there for seven years. We spent three and a half years filling it up, and then three and a half years getting rid of everything, and upgraded to a small apartment in St. Paul. And not only did we have 3,200 square feet, more than the average, we made sure all our closets had all the organizational stuff so we could maximize our stuff. The pictures were taken when we moved out. I didn't know that minimalism would be a thing for me when I started, so I didn't have the before pictures. I just have the after pictures. <laughs> so this is the pantry off our kitchen, master closet, mud room, Laundry room, every single space, every single closet was maximized for stuff. It was all full. We did not have any empty spaces. I'm not going to tell you all about our stuff, but I will tell a couple stories about a piano and some camping gear. I found a free piano about a year after my first was born. And I was so excited because for me, a piano was a symbol that I had arrived as an adult. I had roots, I had stability, my house was ready to raise a family. I grew up in a house with a piano, both my grandparents had a piano, aunts and uncles all had a piano, my older sister had a piano. I needed a piano to be a bona fide adult. The thing was, <laughs> I don't play piano, and neither does my husband. <laughs> but. The reason I had it was I wanted my children to play piano, and I wanted friends and family to play when they came over. Music was important to me. I wanted music to be important to my kids. 
And for five years, it was in our house and never got played once. While downsizing, I struggled a lot with the piano, right? How could I give up on music? Music is important. When was I going to find a free piano again, right? I gave it away. And the moment it drove off in the distance, I felt this great relief. I no longer was stressed about paying for piano lessons, for finding time for piano lessons, for feeling guilty that I never learned to play. All that just fluttered away. And when we have 300,000 things and we make them all important, music was one for me, and we don't do the things that we think are important, we feel guilty, right? If we have things and we don't use them, we, don't, uh, we feel guilty, right, if we don't have time for them. Camping gear was another thing. I camped in college, got all the camping gear. I carried it with me from house to house to house to house for 20 years before we had kids, and I decided the great outdoors are important. I need to get out there. So we doubled down, got more stuff, which bought a camper, <laughs> and committed to six weekends for one summer to go camping. We made it five. It was very stressful. Every time, at the end of the summer, we sold the camper. We could have stayed at five-star hotels and come out ahead financially. I gave away my camping gear as well. The nature of time. Let me find my. Have you seen this quote? You can do anything, but not everything. If we apply it to stuff, right? We can have everything, but we only have time to use those things. Um, we have a limited time to enjoy it. Now, everybody has a different capacity to retain information, catalog belongings. I was quite good at it up until our business doubled in size. And then when my second child came, I became decidedly bad at it. I could not remember what I had. I would lose my keys. It was a struggle to keep up with the house. Um, I didn't want, I knew something had to give, right? I was not staying on top of my life the way I wanted to. I didn't want to give up my business. I didn't want to give up my children. So that's when stuff started leaving in droves. The great outdoors were important to me. Music was important to me. But I cut them out because I didn't have time for them. I accepted these facts about the life that I was living. Oops, pressing the wrong. That 300,000 important things in my house, divided by one life, was a busy life, a scattered life, a frustrated life, and a guilty life. Fewer important things divided by that one life, I could reach my goals and dreams could come true. Where am I? Penelope Trunk. I, are you, have I, any of you heard of these two? Penelope Trunk is one of my favorite bloggers. She, she writes online about careers and homeschooling, raising kids. And she writes a lot about making choices. And she's one of the productivity gurus. Um, and up until this week, synergistically, she had never written about stuff before, but she has, which I'll get to. Um, but she's very in your face, especially to mothers who have careers that you can't do it all. And rather than, rather than feeling oppressed by, by not being able to do it all, not being able to have everything as a mom. Her honesty and in your face about that is actually freeing. And, 
and you can accept yourself and the choices that you make, that you can't have it all, but you can have a lot. Um, minimalism is a lot like that. The idea of living with less feels burdensome, it feels oppressive, not having your stuff, but once your stuff starts to leave, you realize it's, it's so much easier to fly without that weight on your back to reach that self-actualization place. Minimalism is about choosing the things that we want to be important. Well, there's vitally important things and mostly important things, right? And, and, uh, and sorting through those and banishing everything that isn't vitally important is what I've been trying to do. The life-changing magic of tidying up is a best-selling international phenomenon right now. And I, I see some, some people have read it. Anyone read it? Who's read it? Okay. Awesome. I haven't read it yet, but I have friends are, and, and it's, it, they claim it's changed their lives. They take pictures of their houses and post it on Facebook. They're so proud of what, what, um, what this book has done. So I recommend reading it if you need some uh, mot more motivation to, to downsize. She's not a productivity coach per se, but the idea is if you surround yourself with the joyful things, um, the things that you love, and she has specific techniques for for sorting. Maybe someone who's read the book can. <laughs> she's Japanese, and she's developed a system for organizing and decluttering that she talks about. I don't know her name. Anyone? Marie Kondo. Okay, Marie Kondo. Penelope Trunk, my favorite blogger on productivity, just read the book and wrote a blog post about it. So. not working anymore. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I'm just going to give you a couple nuggets that I found worked for me when I was downsizing. And I ended up making a, a mission statement for my house. Have any of you read The Secret or are familiar with the Law of Attraction? No? The Law of Attraction says that what you think about, you bring about, right? But the idea is if you say, I don't want clutter. All the universe hears is clutter, right? It doesn't recognize the negative. And so the self-talk that I had in my head was, why is there so much clutter? Why can't I find anything? Why am I always losing my keys? Why can't my kids pick up after themselves? You know, why do I feel like I'm drowning in my stuff? But when I changed my self-talk, it really helped me uh, sort through my things. So this is my mission statement that I made. You're welcome to use it, but of course your house might have a different goal. I live in a pristine sanctuary that focuses on what's important. I live in a pristine sanctuary that focuses on what's important. And everything I'd pick up or clean, <laughs> I'd ask myself, are you helping me focus on what's important? Are you important? And um, I ended up de-decorating my house because I realized decorating my house wasn't important to me. <laughs> and uh, other things were. But maybe you want to have an entertainment center. Maybe you're, it's where you work and, and you want it to support your work, you know, however it is. Um, think about what's in it and how does that support your larger goals. Designate a space of purgatory. Use liberally. When I say a space of purgatory, that is a place to put all the undecided items, right? When we have stuff, we have it, there's a lot of things that we believe about the stuff that we'll need it just in case, that you know, someday I might need it, or you know, 
I'd get rid of it, but it was really expensive, or I really like it, or it was a gift. You know, there's all kinds of things that we say that uh, prevents us from, from really decluttering. And so I had a space in my garage uh, that I would put things that were undecided. A lot of kids' toys went into purgatory uh, before they, they left, and I'd wait to see if the kids noticed that the toys were gone, first of all. And, um, and then after two or three months, I'd go into purgatory and decide what um, was donated. And generally, if you do need something in purgatory, you'll find out you know, fairly, fairly soon. And you can go get it and bring it back. Living in Rochester, these were things that I did to help get rid of things. The, on the internet, there's Craigslist, which um, you can use to get rid of your stuff as well as to get stuff. Uh, they have a free column as well, so you can either try and earn some money or put it in the free. Free cycle down at the bottom is also uh, a way to get rid of some things. The Salvation Army has a pickup truck. Did you know that? If you have big things and it won't fit in your car, just give them a call, set up a time, and they will, they will take anything that you have to, to donate. It, it, it has to be workable and everything. They, they do turn things down, but... Uh, right. Right. They don't want garbage. So um, for that, you can go to the recycling center or the city dump, right? It's a great to clear all those old paint cans that you've had for 30 years at the recycling center. Uh, Salvation Army, Goodwill, Savers, Restore is new in Rochester, so you can give away the, the faucet that you never installed or whatever you happened to buy at Menards that was on sale and never used. Um, and then the food shelf, too. You know, I don't know if there's, there's uh, uh, food to give away. And garage sales, and I always have garage sales. Any other suggestions? Best Buy. Oh, great point. That's right. Yeah. Best Boy will dispose of, of old TVs, anything. You can bring it there. And it's free to drop off anything. Right? They don't charge it. If you bring... There's only so many items a day, but you can go day after day. Okay. Did you hear that? Best Buy has a limit to what you can bring each day, but you can go back every day to bring more stuff. And the city dump will charge you. It costs money to, to bring mattresses or TVs or what have you at the dump. Depending on the items, you can donate them for <coughs> auctions, like to raise money for the telephone or, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah. Good point. Right. So if some, yeah, I know the Boy Scouts go around once a year, too, and ask for donations. Or there's the, the boxes, or the red boxes? Not the red boxes. Around town, there's places that you can drop off clothing. Yeah? Thank you. Oh, thank you. So Restore also has a truck to come pick up um, things. So if you're remodeling a kitchen, for example, they'll actually come out and take your old cabinets, uh, big things. They have limited hours, so look up. I think they're only open four days a week. This is where you can find me. I'm at skywaymom.com, and my goal is once a week to have a little tidbit about downsizing or living in a small space or living simply or living in downtown St. Paul. That's me. Any questions? Hmm? Which building is it? Where I live? Yeah. Mears Park Place. Okay. <laughs> Yep, I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. Where did they find the space? space here? <laughs> the way it took us a while to figure out how to live in a two-bedroom apartment, and I was very stubborn about it. But the first three months were hard. But the the magic ingredient for us was we gave the kids the master bedroom, right? And then we took the smaller room, and we have a peaceful sanctuary. It's just enough room for our bed and, and the smaller closet for our smaller stuff. And, and they have a big area. It's like a second living room. They sleep Japanese style, so we can just roll up their futon beds and um, put them in the corner, and they've got a play space. 
uh, and they don't mind. They have the, the our big master closet is our garage, and the kids don't mind don't mind sharing that with the remaining clutter of our lives. Whereas for me, it bothers. Yep, yeah, <laughs> downtown St. Paul has, has Mears Park, Wakuda Park, the Union Depot Park, the Mississippi River, and all the trails, and um, we found it to be really amazingly kid-friendly with the Children's Museum, Science Museum, Library, etc. Oh, yep, and they love it. It's like Disneyland, the buses and the trains for them. Right. Yeah, I would consider that minimalizing, you know, because there's minimalizing your physical stuff. And then, sure, there's, I, I've heard people write and talk about digital clutter and, and all that, too. But, but I've always focused on the physical space and physical stuff and minimizing that. Oh, okay, thank you. The question was, to digitize old slides or old photographs, um, is that minimalism, or do you just transfer the clutter from the slides to the uh, the cloud, and you know you still have that stuff connected to you? And and for me, it's it's been a physical thing, right? Downsizing the physical objects around the house. Yeah. Yes, I think of all of the wedding presents we received <laughs> that I gave away. The question was, how do you give away things that are, that are so filled with memories? And the first thing I do is try to give it away to somebody who could appreciate that, right? If you've got family members who could take it, you know, that's, I always tried to give things away to family members that were meaningful first. And then if nobody wanted it, well, nobody wants it, you know, try to give it to somebody who can appreciate it. Maybe not for the years that grandma spent, you know, making bread at the table, but for, you know, the purposes of their family. What was the, what was the tipping point for you? Was it a gradual thing? Was it sudden? But what led you to think, okay, it's time to downsize? Did everyone hear that? The microwave? The, micro <laughs> the microphone. <laughs> uh, it wasn't an immediate thing. I know that happens for some people, and you know, overnight they just get rid of the stuff. It was a very laborious process for me, wondering why I felt so overwhelmed, why, why, you know, just. It's very exciting growing up. You know, you go to school, you go to college, you have kids, you build your career, you know, all this building, and it's, it's so exciting getting, 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 setting up, setting up, setting up. And then once you're coasting, you're set up, you have your family, you're maintaining everything, it's, it, it's just not as exciting. <laughs> and and, and I was, it was very, um, I guess, a little bit bored. You know, and, and it gave me a project, which I always like new projects. And um, there were some inspirations from the internet. ZeroWasteHome.com with a woman named Bea Johnson who actually doesn't make any garbage. She has this museum piece home. There's just absolutely no clutter. And it's her and other people, when I see their homes, I would get this feeling of, <sighs> I wish I had that. And same with tiny house. I got obsessed with the tiny house movement. And, <laughs> uh, and just looking at tiny houses and imagining that. And, and I, I was like, well, maybe I don't have to move to a tiny house, but I can always prepare if it ever happened. <laughs> and it won't. But, um, but I, gradually, I gradually stopped using pieces of, my, of the house. Right? I had a, a, an office dedicated for an office. And my goal was to get, you know, clean out my office closet and then to clean out the office, you know, and I, my office became in the laundry room. And then my goal was to, you know, not need the guest bedroom and then not need the playroom and start 
you know, I did practice in my house for a long time uh, before we moved to a smaller space. <laughs> I just have a kind of question about the difference between less stuff and smaller space. Um, I understand larger space means you think you have to fill it, but I'm curious about your thoughts on you know, why it has to be a small space versus less stuff in perhaps a space with more room to be, to maybe have a guest or two and just have empty space to, you know, give you more room. I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that. Absolutely. I think, I think negative space is great. I actually, I love space. <laughs> um, I, I never stopped loving space, even though I, I, I stopped loving stuff. And we lived in a one bedroom in Nicaragua, all four of us in the same room for an entire year. And we did that because we wanted money to travel and take surfing lessons. And, you know, when we looked at what was important to us and the restraints of our particular budget and what we wanted to spend, we wanted, exper you know, we wanted to spend money in other places than our house. And, and the same is true in, uh, in St. Paul, right? We could have more space, but right now we just want to spend our money somewhere else. So. Have you found that this has spilled over into how you celebrate holidays or special events as well? <laughs> it does. It does. Um, I, every birthday I struggle with in particular because kids have so much joy around stuff, right? It's just, you know, celebrating Christmas or birthdays. But when you observe, you know, the joy of that thing, the thing that they love the most is the one they open last. And then everything before that really gets forgotten. And I noticed when I got, you know, I'd get hand-me-downs from my older sister full of toys or, you know, after a birthday, there was only one or two that really stuck. And, and the rest were just, you know, around the house. So I do, uh, I've experimented with different ideas for, for celebrations without adding lots of stuff. One time I asked people to, to choose something, not, not buy something new, but uh, pick something that their child didn't play with anymore, or just bring something that wasn't packaged. And, and then I felt less guilty about giving it away if they didn't like it. Um, <laughs> or I specifically asked not to bring anything um, that works to varying degrees. And I, my... My parents and my in-laws love giving stuff. So even though I say to the friends, don't bring anything, my kids still get lots and lots of stuff. There's nothing I can do or say. I have learned to stop the grandparents <laughs> from giving less stuff. So. So I've uh, read about um, the I don't know what exactly they call it, the 100 things movement where people try to get the number of possessions down to 100 and they argue about whether a pair of socks is two things or one thing. But right. <laughs> so how many, how many things do you estimate you're down to? I get overwhelmed thinking about it. Um, I, I, I'm guessing when I say we're down 80 to 90 percent. Um, I mean, we had a thousand square foot garage and we had shelving along the entire border and it had stuff filled up. I mean, we were, we uh, owned real estate and were property managers and we'd always get stuff, you know, you know, stuff went on sale at Menards, we'd get it just in case. We would clear out tenants' homes that, you know, would left patio sets. I'm like, all right, we'll bring a patio. I mean, we just, stuff would flow in so easily. Um, and so, yeah, counting, that's an interesting exercise that I, that I haven't done. I live with three other people, so I'm definitely the most gung-ho about the minimalism, and everyone likes the life, but, yeah, it, it uh, I'm... I'm I have their stuff too. So I was just going to ask, uh, how big of a struggle was it for you to approach? I, I assume that you were the one that brought up this whole idea with your family, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, how was that? How did that go over? I guess is the best way to put it. It. it 
it was a lot of mental uh, gymnastics, a lot of, it, it was it was exhausting at points trying to trying to you know you're cutting out things that are for me I mean I I still I haven't gone through my photographs I have I still have the two boxes of photographs <laughs> that that I haven't I haven't dealt with um, yeah I you know just I, I searched the internet for inspiration, you know, because I knew how I felt in other people's homes, and I knew that that were minimalist, and I knew um, when I saw, you know, Dwell magazine architectural spreads, <laughs> I wanted that, <laughs> and and um, yeah, just gradually, for me it was laborious, but it was um, it was worth it. I'm very happy with the results. <laughs> It was funny that you mentioned uh, wedding gifts because when I went to college, all of my plates, everything, it was all brand new in the package still from my parents' wedding. <laughs> and it, it was retro enough that it was almost back in style. So what, it's just kind of funny. But I wanted to let you all know that I help organize a tiny house group here in Rochester. My tiny house should be done in September. And there will be an article out in the Post Bulletin this or on the 22nd or 21st on Tuesday about it with a picture. So if you're curious about why I downsize. Yeah, we could just switch spots at this no. point. No. <laughs> I have 900 square feet. So. I have already downsized and it only took me about a year and we moved and I don't know why, but it was not difficult. But when I completed it, it's just like you say, it was the most free experience I've had in my life. <laughs> and it's absolutely unbelievable. Yep. So I have so few obligations for my house, so then I can enjoy what else I want to do. It's That's awesome. And I did read that tidying up book. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, that little high, like I'd struggle with it, and then I'd give it away, and it, it'd be this little high that I'd get. And she says to take your things and hold them and consider, is there any joy in this? That's, that's kind of an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about, um, I think I even struggle with this, like if I want to leave the house and I think of all the possible contingencies that I might need, do I need to, I mean, I carry a huge purse and it weighs probably like 30 pounds and I have everything I might need or the people around me might need and I get like a sick pleasure of knowing I've got what you need. And, and I think that like follows into your house, it falls into your garage, uh, this is my dad here, he loves it when he has a piece of scrap wood that is just the right size. And mm -hmm. uh, is that something that... Like I said, everybody has a different capacity to catalog belongings and keep track of stuff. And I, one of my good friends here is very good at it. She's like you with a huge person. She's she's a good sidekick for me because <laughs> I don't carry things around just in case because I decided just in case, you know, rarely happens. But when it does, she's a good friend to have. Um, but, you know, if she's not there, you survive. <laughs> you get yourself to a store. But I, I, when I cleaned my junk drawer after two years or however much time had passed, I had seven chapsticks, I don't know how many pens and pencils and three d different ways to hang up picture frames. And, you know, I just, I realized that I was not good at keeping track of things because I would forget I had it. It would get lost in all the stuff and then I'd go buy another one and it would, you know, multiply on top of itself. So. <laughs> I can assure you it was a minimalist uh, approach to life. And uh, I enjoy very much the things, uh, the accoutrements and all the additionals that I have access to now. I'm on the border of uh, feeling that weight that, that you've described, but <clears throat> um, 
I don't carry a big purse around either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think for me what it's really about is being resourceful and not wasteful. And when we or when I would knee jerk buy something because I needed something and not stop to think what I had already or what could I do to, you know, solve my problem. Uh, Nicaragua really opened my eyes to that because there's such poverty there and people are doing amazing things with so little. And, you know, I would watch myself solve problems in such a different way. I mean, I, I needed stuff to, um, you know, I had luggage and they had plastic garbage bags and we used them for the same things. Um, I had a special swimming suit to go swimming and they just used their shorts and a shirt. You know, like they, they figured out how to do the same thing but with less stuff. And, and it, I think about that a lot when I need something. You know, what would, what would a Nicaraguan do? <laughs> so. And minimum space equals goodness, right? Not necessarily. Okay. No. So what is your measure for goodness? And my solution, if your thesis, less stuff and minimum space, is everybody give up Rochester and move to Appalachia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think I have found minimalism and less stuff for me to be an effective tool to to focus on the things that, that I um, chose to be important, right? I, I wanted to learn a language. I wanted to travel. I wanted to have more time for my kids. And for me, a smaller space and less stuff helps me achieve those goals. So it's good for me. But depending on your goals and what's important, it can be totally different. I'm, I'm wondering about the Barbie dream house. I mean, do, the kids' toys. What, what, toys now, it seems like, are, are so plentiful and large. And how, how have you handled that? I mean, your kids My are kids that have age toys, and the have... truth is they, they play their video games or their iPads, or we go, you know, swimming or to the park, or, you know, I, you know we try to keep them busy. But they, they, I've seen them have so much more imagination when they play, too. Like, when I turn off the TV and they just, you know, they, I don't know, they, they play games, you know, they, there's lava on the floor and they're jumping on pillows and they turn the cardboard boxes into a thousand things. And I just see so much more creativity. And I started wondering about that when I brought my kids and other people's kids as a real estate agent into vacant homes. We'd walk into vacant homes and the kids would just run wild and they would have so much fun in these empty houses and watching that I wondered you know is there something to this and I'd watch my kids play with all their toys and the game was to dump them all out and put them all over the house and then they were done <laughs> and yeah so <laughs> right here. I, I have a comment and also a question so I used to have a three-bedroom house and full of stuff and eventually sold it. And in the process, then you kind of go through what stuff you need and don't need. Ended up putting a lot of it in storage and traveled for about eight months with whatever could fit in my Ford Focus. So not very much. You just you realize what's really important to your day-to-day -day life. But when I came back and went into that storage unit, I had this huge feeling of like weight and anxiety, just seeing all this stuff and going, I have to deal with this stuff now. And it, it was a very tough experience. And now I'm in the process of, okay, I got to get rid of one thing a week because I just want to, I, I don't want it weighting me down anymore. But um, my question is, how does location of where you live deal with um, your, your ability to have less stuff? Sure. Uh, you know, St. Paul to Rochester. Sure. I'm not sure how, I, I'm in an urban environment, so it's easy, you know, if I didn't keep any just in case stuff, right, I, my medicine cabinet is ibuprofen, like that's all I have, um, and, but if I need something, you know, it's just right there, unfortunately I have to buy 
the whole thing. I love Nicaragua for that reason. If you needed a throat lodge, <laughs> cough drop, <laughs> you could buy one cough drop and, and not have any stuff. They've got a great culture uh, set up around that. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up on a farm and I think that's part of the reason I had so much stuff is the house was a mini Walmart store so that you didn't have to go to Walmart when, when you needed something. So having stuff just in case was really important. Uh, but we, you know, I wrote about this on the, on the website. There's this concept of derivatives, right? We, we've been programmed to have specific tools for specific tasks, right? We, to clip our fingernails, we need a fingernail clipper, right? Is there no other way to do that? I mean, you know, there are other, you know, it's certainly the best tool probably to do it, but you could do it with the scissors, you could do it with your teeth, you know, you, there, there are ways to cut your fingernails <laughs> without stuff. And, you know, for every, every single thing, um, I, I've become a mason jar aficionado. I love mason jars. I use them for a thousand different ways. My husband loves tools and specific tools, and we had a uh, domestic spat about coffee cups because he thought we should have more. I said, well, we have four. Well, what if more people come and need to drink hot tea? I'm like, well, you can use a mason jar while you need a handle. I'm like, no, you don't. You can hit, but it's hot. You know, and we went back and forth, and I'm like, I, you know, you can drink a hot drink in a mason jar. Like, it's, it's possible. You just hold it at the top, and, and he's like, you know, <laughs> He says, fine. And, um, but it was, you know, just, there, there's, there's, we think of these specific tools that we need, but if we think creatively and, and um, like a Nicaraguan, <laughs> I like to say, we don't need so much. So I had a, a comment about something you said when somebody asked about giving away very personal stuff, sentimental, you know, from family and that sort of thing. Um, you said if there are family members who might want it, and it made me think of my own family, and I just visited, just came back from visiting my mom, and she's got her own hoarding problem. That's where I get it. <laughs> and she is in the process of trying to get rid of a lot of stuff because she's, she's getting at that age where moving to a smaller place would be really good. And her excuse is she has too much stuff. So we talked quite a bit about it, and my daughter had been doing crafty stuff with her cousin and I said oh did you want to give that to Oma one of those you know and my daughter looked at me and said I thought she's trying to get rid of her stuff and I thought oh you're right so I said to my mom okay this is what Olivia made and for your own good she's not giving it to you <laughs> <laughs> but we'll take a picture of the two of you with it and then you can have that you know, and I just thought it was a very profound thing for her to get that message to say, I thought she's getting rid of it, you know. So um, sometimes finding family members that might want it might not be doing them any favors. <laughs> yeah, sure, right. <laughs> no. I see what you mean, yeah. yeah. But, um, it, it's, it's a, but yeah. a lot of it is, is, is the responsibility, right? When you have stuff, you're responsible for it. And that's the burden, right? To make sure that it goes to a good home, that it isn't wasteful, that it doesn't just become garbage, that it doesn't become forgotten, right? The responsibility is on your shoulders. But this crazy thing happens when the responsibility sits on somebody else's shoulders, you don't care what happens to it, <laughs> you know? Um, it's their responsibility and, you know, they're the people that you'll get mad at if, if you remember that you really wanted the table or whatever it is. Um, and I know my family does that to me. I'll get stuff and, and you know, my mother-in-law will say, I don't care what you do with it, but it's yours now and, and I'll take it to the Goodwill for her. <laughs> so. And maybe she gives it to you because she knows you're going to give it stuff away. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Better than her. maybe. I was just going to share a couple things um, with uh, friends that are about my age and myself included. When we give gifts, it's always either a gift card or consumables mm -hmm. because we both say things are going out, not coming in, and so we kind of help each other that way. But an experience I had a long time ago, this was in the middle 80s or so, and uh, I was in the Soviet Union, and the... Um, 
storefronts there didn't have things in the storefronts. They had pictures on the wall of things that may or may not have been in the store. Mm -hmm. So we didn't see things. Uh, there were a few exceptions, toys, because the children are the center of things there. But we didn't really see that until we got our first uh, first place back out of the United States was in Helsinki, and our bus was waiting for us in front of a department store, and the the spread of stuff in that display window, it, it I just felt almost sick at seeing it. It was so overwhelming. And I had it was actually harder transitioning back out of there than it was transitioning in seeing so little stuff. And, and that was an amazing thing to experience. Right, because it was invisible before, right? I, I, that, for me, that's what, like, all the garbage that we create and wastefulness, it was invisible, invisible. And then when I started actually, like, trying not to be wasteful and make garbage and have so much stuff, I started see, really seeing it, and it was, yeah, it's overwhelming. <laughs> it's how much, it's a little after eight. I don't know. You're good. If there's any other questions, you still got ten minutes. Okay. I just had a comment on, on being creative, or I don't know if it is that creative, but uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I had a roommate, she, they, there's a Keurig in the house, and all of a sudden the Keurig wasn't working, and it was like, I need my coffee, and she was, well, how are we gonna get coffee? And I'm like, well, let's think about it. And so we were brainstorming, we found a funnel, and we folded a coffee filter in half, and we boiled water and poured it in, and we're like, wow, this is genius. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really not that genius. <laughs> So it's kind of funny the stuff that we buy and we think we need and we need to live with and they take up so much space and it's just like, let's simplify this. That's an awesome example. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. How about... <laughs> I had to transition to a bigger bowl tonight because there were so many people that put their name in for the gift card. Talk about minimalizing. <laughs> minimalizing. Okay. They want stuff from the M Gear store. So. <laughs> I see a coffee mug out there. <laughs> a free coffee mug was what started it. He came home with a mug from a 5K race he ran, and I'm like, what's this mug for? Well, I thought we could use another one. <laughs> Karen Kohler? Caitlin. Oh, yay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Can give her another round of applause, please. Please join us again next week. We will be back out on the plaza. Um, we'll have Tom Nostead with us to uh, speak about um, his journey toward gratitude. So please join us. It'll be a beautiful, it'll be a beautiful talk. <laughs>